I'm going to talk uh, for about the next uh, 20 minutes or so just on, on the state of the county, and I'll give my disclaimer right up front. There's a little bit of everything in this presentation. Uh, in terms of, I'm usually not a, a very uh, desired guest on, on radio panel discussions or something with other county executives, because I, I talk about government, that's what we do, and uh, I'm not going to take credit for low unemployment in the county or prognosticate about what uh, what that figure is going to be next year. So we'll just talk about some of the things that the county's done, I guess. Um, I, I look at uh, what we do as, as being important to, to business in terms of, of creating good government, a good place to live, reasonable taxes, and uh, that's what we'll spend a little bit of time talking about first. I wanted to talk then next, and, and this maybe will segue a little bit into the next speakers about some of the uh, uh, impacts of, of the recession and as uh, you know, as, as the economic recovery has been going along, I, I think um, some of the things that we attributed to the recession are not necessarily the case. Uh, I think there's demographic changes and things going on in the county, which uh, we'll, we'll talk about, and I know um, our next speakers are, are way more up on than I am. And then finally, some challenges that the county has for the future. So uh, these are kind of the topics that are, are near and dear to me, and, and as uh, Derek had introduced our uh, We've got two of our supervisors on the county board, Nancy Russell, who has been uh, chair for, for many years and, and on the board since 2002, I think, Nancy, so uh, during this entire time. But what we've tried to do is, is create um, a good infrastructure in terms of our, our physical plant, our buildings, trying to pay off our debt. Actually, we paid off all of our debt. Um, creating uh, transportation, uh, both in terms of moving people uh, through our, our shared ride and the senior disabled program as well as uh, the transportation infrastructure, roads, bridges, which we've paid a lot of attention to lately. Trying to keep a handle on, on taxes, which uh, I think we've done a good job uh, with, the, with the help of the state of Wisconsin uh, as well in terms of uh, the levy limits, which we can talk about as we go along. And then finally, our um, post-employment uh, liability, which is a, a hot topic yet. I think uh, in terms of unfunded pension liability, this happens to be an unfunded um, health, health benefit liability. So talk a little bit about our, our infrastructure, and I know some of you have been in the county uh, a long time and, and remember some of the uh, facilities that we used to have, and this is about you know, 2001 or 2002, that was probably one of our better buildings, but we operated out of a series of old uh, abandoned nursing homes and uh, nursing dormitories and old hospital buildings, and. Uh, that was pretty much uh, how we operated, and uh, that was uh, not a very efficient way to do things, uh, not only in terms of being, I uh, say, nickel and dime by repairs, it was millions of dollars of repairs, also you know, inefficient to heat and cool, and staffing, uh, they did not lend themselves to very efficient staffing models. So starting in about 2000, uh, 2004, uh, we embarked on a program to really replace and modernize a lot of our buildings. So the Judicial Center, 2005, uh, Lakeland uh, Healthcare Center uh, replaced our old uh, nursing home, 2006. Uh, Lakeland School, that's a building I, I, I'm sure you're familiar with, but I'm really proud of, of that and what goes on there. I think it's a, it's a unique program in the state of Wisconsin. There's only really one other, and, and this has got that deep, in my opinion. Um, public Works facility, that's uh, out on Highway N, and you see that, that big shop, the maintenance facility for our vehicles. That was a 2016 project. And then uh, the newest one, which uh, we're actually going to open up bids next week, Thursday, is our Health and Human Services building. Uh, that is, uh, we're, we'll hopefully uh, begin construction, hopefully get good bids, begin construction in fall. Uh, with uh, December 2019 or 2020 um, date uh, to, to occupy. That's going to be between the old, the new nursing home or the Lakeland Healthcare Center and the uh, Judicial Center, so it moves across the road. Uh, what that building, $24.1 million, and I'm happy to say we're paying cash for that, we're not bonding for any of this. Uh, and this isn't, sometimes in government it seems like, you know, well, this is really rocket science, I'm sure to folks in business it isn't, but uh, this is really kind of a, a change that we made about 2012, and I'll explain this a little bit, uh, this graph, but uh, basically the, the red 
segment is the decline in value of our buildings, so the book value of our buildings, which depreciates every year. Uh, and the blue is, is the money that we started in, uh, in about 2012 budget uh, to, uh, to fund that depreciation. So basically, by the amount by which the buildings depreciate, we take a like amount, put it aside, for uh, building uh, replacement or major uh, capital upgrades. You can see uh, the green, is uh, that's uh, that should be blue, ideally, but uh, we had started this uh, fairly late, and so a journey of a 1,000 miles starts with a, a single step. And anyway, this, uh, this methodology has really allowed us to start paying cash for things, uh, including uh, that, that new HHS building. So this is a, a practice that we hope to continue. Talk a little bit about uh, infrastructure. There's a chip ceiling that's going on right there. Uh, maybe a little bit hard to see, but uh, we're basically taking on a bridge every year from, and we started that in about 2016 uh, through 2027, a bridge replacement. Uh, this year, uh, 2018, we're going to be doing on Highway G up by uh, East Troy. It's about a million dollar project. Uh, but the idea is to, um, to you know, that, that can be a real killer uh, if a bridge is out in terms of uh, its impact on business, so we want to get proactive and, uh, and replace those before, um, before they have to be shut down, which is occurring in places, occurring in our county, even in, in several townships, so uh, we want to stay on top of that. This is just a little excerpt from our, our code of ordinances, but we have uh, actually established uh, a rule or, or an ordinance that talks about having a, a, an average PACER reading, which is, that's how you evaluate highways of the on a scale of 1 to 10. Uh, we fix that at 7, so we have to make sure that all the roads uh, meet that, which we have been doing. Uh, and so that entails doing uh, road reconstruction every year, a, a planned program of that. This year we'll be working on Highway H in the Genoa City area, and we do uh, several miles of that every year, and I think uh, in general, and I, I get calls sometimes for the contrary, but in general I think our county roads are in pretty good shape relative to, uh, relative to a lot of other counties. This is kind of a neat story, and this just came to uh, fruition in March. I think I got an email from our finance director, Nicky Anderson, that indicated we had made our last uh, bond payment, so we uh, it actually called uh, our last bond issue and um, paid off our debt. So uh, that was a, a really neat accomplishment, and I give credit to the county board for having uh, the discipline to do that. Uh, I don't know, and I, I tried to stump Todd Berry whether we were the only county in that position, and uh, he may contradict me or may, may clarify that in, in, his, uh, in, in his remarks here. But uh, debt service, we showed all those buildings that we built, and we had to pay for it some way. And the way we paid for it was by borrowing money. So we had, um, this is just the, the payment on, on our debt service. And you know, if you look at that chart, um, you know, we were paying $9 million a year at one point just to pay off the bondholders, principal and interest payments. And uh, so that was crushing in and of itself. But if you look at some of those increases, like a 2005 to 26, you know, you sit down with the budget and you've got almost $2 million built in, a $2 million increase. So that's like starting a pretty significant county department uh, just paying paying off debt. So um, you see those uh, debt service uh, payments decreasing over time. That's uh, the principal amount of the debt that was outstanding. So uh, we hit our high water mark of about $55 million in 2008. It was complicated by the, the the factor that we were also borrowing for our road program, and that was a, a, a little bit of smoke and mirrors accounting, I think, that the board had engaged in some time ago. But uh, the county had, in general, for years paid for that road program that I talked about, bridges, um, uh, reconstruction of roads, through the tax levy, so they are paying current dollars for it. Well, then the state came along with a levy cap and said, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to limit the amount of levy increases. Actually, back then it was a quite generous cap because it, it took into account the full increase in equalized value in the county, which in our case was sometimes 13 or 14 percent. So that's not a bad cap to have. It also excluded debt service, so hence that was the reason why the road program now transferred from current levy dollars to debt because it wasn't counted in that cap. And it's kind of like a, you know, a, 
that may be a bad analogy, but like a, a drug addict, you know, once you get, once you start using those bar, borrowed dollars, it's very hard to wean yourself off in terms of, uh, of correcting that. But so with all this other stuff going on, the board had they made a commitment to uh, move the road program back onto the tax levy. So 2011 was actually the last time we issued bonds for anything, but that was uh, the last time we borrowed uh, for, for roads. So uh, 2018, March, we, we paid it off. Uh, this was, uh, Wisconsin Counties Association actually came out with a little a, a brochure, and I don't, I'll, I don't even say that, but it, this was actually a useful brochure that had a lot of comparative data in it, and uh, this was one that they had on general obligation debt per capita. So uh, in that case, it's good to be uh, in the, the lighter color there. Walworth County is, is white, uh, which is, um, we still had, I think it was 2015, so we still had debt, but at a very low level. Uh, and this is, uh, Unless somebody materially changed things here, there's 72 counties on there, and everybody had the general obligation debt. So I think we might be the only one without. Um, but uh, I, I think that's a, a great place to be. Transportation. So we talked a little bit about the transportation infrastructure, the bridges, uh, the roads. But we've also tried to make a concerted effort to move people from point A to point B in the county, people who can't drive for a variety of different reasons. And so. Uh, this is kind of a confusing chart here, but I'll try to explain it a little bit. But, but really the gist is, if you look towards the end of the chart, the difference between the blue line and the red line. So we have two different transportation programs. Historically, we just provided transportation for senior and disabled adults under a, a, a state program. We also uh, supplemented that with levy dollars. But that was the extent of our transportation program. And I think probably since the first day I got here in the county, uh, that was always the, the lament and it was a valid concern is that there's no way for people to get around in the county. So we had, uh, that's where you, you shift to the red line 2016, probably about May or June of 16, we really made a concerted effort to try to promote this program. So Nancy Russell was one of those people, I would do that and we'd go and take a road show. We'd go to the, uh, the senior movie day at, uh, and, and put out brochures and go to uh, assisted living facilities and whoever would have us, uh, senior centers, and really promoted it. And it was kind of interesting because at, at that point, then that program really started to take off. It was partly a matter of creating awareness. But uh, that senior disabled uh, population is, is only part of the equation in terms of moving people around the county. So we started in uh, 2017 a program, a shared ride program, uh, under a mass transit grant, so we also use some levy dollars for that as well, but it's called a dial ride. And uh, you can see here, uh, this is a brand new program, and that's a little bit hard to read. I'm not sure why they chose the colors that they did on that, but um, that's rides per day, average rides per day, 106 rides. So uh, that program has really started out as nothing, and it's, it's moving folks around. I've, taken it a few times myself. Uh, there are people who use that to get to work. Um, it's five bucks a round trip, Nancy, is that? I think so, yeah. So for it, adults, yeah. It's, it's reasonable for somebody who may be making closer to a minimum wage uh, to take that, and that's you know a lot of people who are going to take it, but, but there were folks who use that to, to get to work and to get to appointments. There's no age limit or anything on that, and there's no trip purpose that we uh, impose on that uh, ride. So we covered uh, transportation. I wanted to talk just a little bit about tax increases. And we've got, uh, if you have better eyesight than me, I handed out a budget and brief book. And uh, it'll give a little bit of history of the same information that's in there. But feel free to take it along if you're at all interested. If not, just leave it uh, behind. I don't want to burden you with, with extra stuff. But it contains a lot of the information that, that I'm covering here today. So um, the last uh, the last column there is the uh, percent of the levy change. So uh, we were uh, for a number of years we had actually frozen uh, the levy. Uh, all the increases have been basically a half percent or less, and we actually had cut the levy, and that had to do with the little uh, issue with the formula. But uh, it was a decrease of actually 1.86 percent. I mentioned that the, the, the levy increase that the state had imposed was quite a liberal cap years ago when I first had started in this job, limiting you to the increase in equalized value. So that, that took into account the increase in home prices, right? So if there was a natural increase in, in the, the price of homes, 
you were given that, counties were given that, uh, and municipalities uh, given that leeway to raise the levy. Um, so the pendulum, you know, I think when the economy was booming or house prices are, are doing well now, it might might serve us good to, to be back into that formula. But that was, in my opinion, a pretty toothless cap because we raised taxes 10, 11% per year when that cap was in place. Pendulum swung pretty hard to the other direction, which limited the tax uh, levy increase to the value of net new construction taking place in the county. So essentially, if you had a 1% increase in new construction, then you were allowed to increase your levy by 1%. And uh, that is a, a much a tighter cap, and I think um, we're, we're starting to feel some of the uh, strains of that in part because we haven't had a real robust net new construction taking place in the county, and hopefully that is going to change, but we were um, lagging behind the state average <coughs> in terms of, of that. Final uh, topic here I wanted to talk about, just in terms of the, some of our nuts and bolts, is our other post-employment um, benefit. And uh, this has to do with unfunded pension liabilities, where you often hear about it in the news with other uh, organizations. Our old tab liability, other post-employment, liability really related to health insurance that was promised to workers. So uh, at the point when health insurance was a, a thousand dollar a year item, you know, way back, it was routinely thrown into contract negotiations that when you retired, you, um, you were able to get uh, certain health insurance coverage as a retiree. So multiple ways to own that, deputies would get uh, coverage uh, basically starting uh, after retirement, uh, teachers got five years of single premium coverage, general employees could convert sick leave into uh, health credits and pay for it. So about uh, 2004, it, it, uh, it occurred to us that um, if we were to not create some type of fund or plan for that, that probably by about now, um, we would be spending most of the county tax money on uh, retiree benefits as opposed to programs. So at that point, 2005, the board started, we had a, a, a liability, you know, a little $15 million or so that we had calculated in that year. We started with a single, setting aside $300,000, which seemed kind of uh, uh, pointless at the time, but you know, again, credit to the board, I think maintained a discipline to uh, continue to put uh, money in that and to factor that into the, the budget and uh, to save up. So, so basically, you see that red line is what the liability is. That's how much we, we owe retired employees. The blue line is uh, actually uh, trust funds that are available. So our liability is actually uh, an asset right now. Uh, we benefited from uh, uh, some investments, which is not any credit to our investment acumen, but uh, increasing stock markets. So uh, I personally would like to get this to the point where we've got it in more fixed investments and, and it becomes more predictable, but right now, that is in a good, good place. I just wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about the impact of the recession. I think for you know, the, the housing crisis and, and the subprime, the, uh, subprime impacts, and I think we attributed a lot of things to that at the time because we were flying high here in terms of increases in equalized value, 14% annually. We were one of the, traditionally one of the highest increases in the state. Things were really booming here. Uh, and that was in, in the early 2000s to mid 2000s. And so after that, um, we, we maybe a regression to the mean, but we were hit hardest probably among almost all of Wisconsin counties in terms of, of that recovery. So we attributed, I think, a lot of that to well, it's, it's this you know, recession, it's a subprime crisis. And I'm not uh, an economist by, by any uh, stretch of the imagination, but I think. There are some other factors now in retrospect that were impacting that because our recovery has been um, not, you know, we didn't, we didn't bounce back and I'll show you a little bit about that. Population growth or lack thereof is one of the factors I think that is really impacting the county uh, for uh, a number of times and I kind of look back at old columns that I wrote and actually when I started doing that in about 2002, 2003, we were um, like the third fastest growing county in the state of Wisconsin. And you see, it's a little bit hard to see how dramatic this is, but um, you, you see a plateauing of population. So our population growth has been very static in this county, which is fairly unusual, you know, going back from the 1980s at least. So we're not having, uh, and this is not necessarily unique to Walworth County, uh, it's, a, it's a statewide phenomenon, but that population growth has uh, 
uh, is really slow. And so, you know, and by like a magnitude of 10, I mean, we're talking like three tenths of a percent increase per year when sometimes it had been several, you know, two percent or something like that. So, population had, you know, ratcheted down already, I think, by the time of, uh, you know, say, the sub, you know, subprime crisis. Uh, this is, uh, we're still not nearly in as, as bad a shape as. Um, a lot of the other counties in the state, you know, so you look at um, our, our change has not been as dramatic as some of the counties, particularly in the up north, uh, that have experienced a decrease in population. Here is, um, but to put it in perspective, if we were one of the third fastest growing counties in the state for some time, this is the list out of 72 counties of um, our counties that have, have had a slower population growth than us. So we're definitely below average in terms of our population growth from at least that period 2012 to 2017. Uh, I wanted to mention equalized value and sometimes I throw around terminology too much uh, without explaining it, but equalized value is essentially a bunch of nuances to it, but if you took every piece of taxable property in the county and, and sold it, that would be the fair market value that it would fetch. And if you see this, um, you know, we, like I said, we were we were some high flyers, so you know, look at that line is almost going straight up from, from 2006 to 2008. I mean, that is huge growth that we had. Again, it was one of the fastest in the state, uh, if not the, the fastest of second, maybe kind of during that period. Well, you know, 20, 2008, 2009, we still increased, and then after that, we fell off of a huge cliff. So uh, you look at, I mean, what Todd has, has written about this, but we're north of, of 14 billion uh, with equalized value right now, but that's still far short of where we were um, prior to that in 2009. So I think we are one, of, at least when I had written on this uh, maybe a year ago, I think we were in a group of three counties that had not yet fully recovered or had made the slowest recovery. So uh, that is still, you know, I would expect it's going to increase, uh, but I, I don't know that we're going to get back to 15. Five at, at the next uh, when equalized value is determined in August. This is kind of a proxy that we use, and, and we don't building permits are issued by the municipalities, and we don't keep uh, track of that or track what they do. But um, the registered deeds um, documents that they record is somewhat of a proxy, I think, for things that are going on out there. And uh, this is what was kind of interesting to me in retrospect is you, you look at that chart is on the you now there's other factors that influence that refinances mortgage forms get you know longer and things like that but um, we're definitely on the decline uh, prior to that 2008 so I, my theory now is I think there was just a, a, something else you know that recession definitely didn't help us but I think there was also a trend going on uh, before then. Challenges for the future, and I'm going to wrap this up as quickly as I can here because we've got other speakers. I have uh, our fire EMS issue, some demographics, which we touched on, and then also taxation. So fire EMS is kind of an interesting topic. Uh, the county has been served basically by volunteers in both for fire service and EMS, and that system is getting close to the breaking point, and there's a variety of reasons for that. Not everybody agrees on all of them, but the idea of getting people, and they're very generous folks who would volunteer to do that, uh, is if that community is getting smaller and smaller as people are going farther out for work or engaged in other activities or you've got younger people who are, are, are moving into the, uh, into the communities. Uh, so in any event, we're, we continue to study this to see what the, what the options are and um, we'll see where we go. I, I think one of the options is it's going to cost money. Um, you know, it, it just happened as kind of a, a, a feature of history that people were gracious and volunteered to drive ambulances and fire trucks and uh, by the same token many communities fund full-time police departments and so in a lot of cities I think it, you see those budgets are usually comparable so we're looking at some other solutions I think it's a good group of folks that we have local leaders that are looking into that but uh, I think that that's going to be a, a, a pressure point there for uh, a number of the town cities villages who have the responsibility to provide that service um, our goal is, of course, to keep that sustainable. Demographics is the second challenge for the future, and uh, we're getting older. I hate to break that to you uh, if that hasn't occurred to you, but um, this is uh, this is an excerpt on uh, some a different uh, a timeline in terms of, of the population, and I took my notes here on a post-it note, so that's probably not a good thing, but I just looked at the 80 and older uh, demographic, and so 
uh, if you look at that, 4,725 county residents fit that category. And I just use that, and, and there's lots of folks who are 80 who are driving and active working and all that, but when you get to 90 and over, and, and that demographic is at least, I think, one that is, is going to require uh, services and transportation. So that figure by 2035, which sounds like a, a Buck Rogers or something, isn't that far away. I hate to break that to you, too. Uh, the, the 17 years. My math is bad, so I went into law, but that, that, that goes into 90, 9,300, so that, that almost doubles in, in that 15 year time period. That's a little hard to wrap your head around, but that's you know 5,000 people. That's like a, a, you know, a couple of Fontanas or something or more of, uh, of people in that demographic. And then by 2040, uh, which is, is 22 years away, that, that figure jumps to 11,400. So we are definitely aging. Again, I don't know that that's unique in the state of Wisconsin, but we're certainly not immune to it. And uh, again, you look at it relative to the rest of the state, uh, we're, we're actually doing quite well, but um, you can't deny the, the numbers or uh, the increase. Um, final uh, added piece slide, so I didn't have any other one. Uh, challenges for the future, taxation, I, I think this is a system, you know, and, and kind of that's going to reach critical mass at some point. You've got, I think, 1,850 jurisdictions that assess property in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, as a result, I, the Milwaukee Journal had reported um, several years ago that municipalities, counties are collecting from the wrong taxpayers in about 20% of the cases, if you can imagine that. So, and this isn't like your cable bill, right? I mean, this we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars, and uh, it, it, it any any time you have you know 1,800 different places putting values on property, the state attempts to equalize it. Although uh, I, I'm not sure how successful that is. There was a proposal to have countywide assessment. Maybe not a bad idea. I don't think any money was attached to it, which is a problem if, if the county is going to take something like that over. The process I think is very confusing to taxpayers. I get probably most calls from people uh, they don't understand it, and I'm not picking on them at all, it, it, it can be a confusing process. So they look at it and say, well, you know, my, I don't have a third bedroom, I only have two bedrooms, my tax bill says three bedrooms. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, you know, you've got to talk to your, your local assessor, well, where are they? Appleton, okay, well, when can I do that? Uh, well, you missed open book, I'm afraid, so, um, you know, you wait till next year, and uh, it, it just gets very confusing to them. Also, you know, there's a hundred different ways and nuances to this. Uh, one is, you know, that recent sale, uh, kind of issue, uh, and the, the journal had highlighted one of these, so it, this is the Milwaukee area, Milwaukee area taxes, which are, are generally higher, but it was, the person buys a, a, a 319, a house that's assessed at $319,000 for $249,000, right? So they got a good good value, probably not gonna happen in today's market. But, um, so one would think, since it was very similar to other houses on the block, that everybody would get a decrease, right? No. So, you know, this individual is very common, goes into the assessor, shows the fair market value of the house, this is what I paid for it, their taxes go down by $1,642, in this case the neighbors went up by $600, pretty much identical houses. So it, 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 something's got to give, and, and I'm not sure exactly what that's going to be, but there's smarter people than I can figure that out. But also the shift, I think, over time to residential taxpayers as um, and that's been pretty dramatic. Uh, I think something like 70% title, correct me, and all that stuff uh, of the tax bill now has shifted to the residential uh, tax payer. And that is my last slide. So I think we're doing questions maybe at the end there. So hopefully you'll forget about everything I said by then. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. I know you always joke that it's dry material, but it, I, I think it was, it, you know, even though we have challenges that you outlined, I think it, it shows that we're positioned really well to meet those challenges. And I think all of us need to talk about that more. I think it's just a great thing. Um, next speaker is Todd Berry. Uh, Todd, I have to tell you, uh, I love your, or I know you don't do that anymore, but your newsletters uh, and, and the insights, but I used to have to lock myself in a room and really sit there and concentrate on those, but a lot of good material. Anyways, um, I'd like to have Todd come up and, and talk with us now. Well, it, it, it's really good to be here. I have spoken to this group off and on for a number of years, and uh, to sort of get to come back, even though I'm 
almost dead in the has been. Um, <laughs> it's really very nice of Derek to ask me to come back. Um, as you may know, I was I headed the Wisconsin Taxpayers Alliance for 25 years, and Dave made my day because one of the last projects I worked on um, was a fact book. The counties came to the Taxpayers Alliance and said, well, as some of you may know over the years, um, I, uh, at the Taxpayers Alliance, we did a lot of work on state level government and uh, finance and economics and so forth. And our mission really was to teach and inform the public and the press and public officials about state and local government. So I'm going to sort of return to that. Um, at, at the very biggest level, um, just to put this in some context, um, the federal government puts out figures on state tax burdens uh, every year and um, through the Census Bureau. And just within the last year or two, uh, if you look at Wisconsin's total tax burden, state and local as a share of income, we were about at the national average. And we rank, our rank in terms of state was, you know, in the high teens, roughly. Um, so I can remember, if you look back, I can remember when Wisconsin went from ranking 18th in the country to first. Um, so to sort of drift down, and it's been, it's been a drift over a number of years through multiple uh, governors in both parties, but it's, it's been on a drift down since the 90s. So sort of the biggest picture. Um, I, since the topic is the state of the county, um, the thing I can bring to this, uh, and Dave did a super job on talking about Walworth County and, and so many of the things that I worked on on a statewide basis I saw flying in front of me uh, in terms of trends. But what I'd like to do is sort of put uh, Walworth County in a larger context of both the state economy and uh, the interactions between state and local government. <coughs> um, Dave really hit on the big trends in terms of uh, economics in Wisconsin. <clears throat> um, it should be said for starters that Wisconsin is not a, does not have an economy that grows at really rapid rates. It hasn't and it won't. Um, it's the nature of the kind of economy Wisconsin has. Um, we don't tend to plunge as far in recessions as other states. We don't tend to peak as high either. Um, <clears throat> but um, we sort of chug along. Um, we have very low unemployment rates here, but to be honest, it's linked not so much to the strength of the economy as it is to something else Dave mentioned, and as that is demography. And that really is the state's biggest challenge. Um, we at the Taxpayers Alliance started looking at this back 2000, 2001, 2003, hoping that, uh, that state leaders, both private and public, would start to pay attention to this. And then we updated it in 2014. And to my frustration, there just hasn't been enough focus on this because Dave's numbers for Walworth County very much reflect the state, and that is that between now and 2040, um, the state's labor force is not going to grow. It's going to be flat because you've got baby boomers leaving the labor market and pushing up the number of retirees, and the state numbers are very much what Dave showed. They're going to double by 2040. Um, and at the same time, you just don't have as big groups of population coming in behind them. So how to make an economy grow when you don't have a labor force that is growing, uh, which means people paying income and sales taxes and buying homes and all that, really is the fundamental challenge facing Wisconsin. Um, Dave also mentioned property values. And there, again, the, the state story is very similar to Walworth. Um, last year was the first time since 2008 that the total property value of the state actually got back to pre-recession levels. And uh, one thing that <clears throat> should give us all pause is that even at that time, 
the total value of residential property in the state had not come back to where it was pre-recession. Um, so probably when the numbers come out in August, this will be the first time since 2008 that the total residential value of the state uh, will be back above the recessionary level. So it's been a very long and slow climb back. back. <coughs> anyway, I wanted to sort of, that's sort of the economic context. And, and Walworth County is sort of nicely positioned in some respects. It's sort of in this hammock between Chicago and Madison and Milwaukee, and, and, that, uh, and that gives it's a region that is, is a good place to be compared to, say, northwest or northern Wisconsin. And as Dave's map showed, there's some real hurt going on in some of those regions in terms of declining population and property values that aren't recovering and so forth. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk mainly, though, about government. And uh, you have to, in Wisconsin, when you talk about local government, you have to talk about state government uh, because of what happened 150 years ago. And that is a lot, at first, a lot of New Englanders came up, uh, got up and moved out here, and they brought New England government with them. So we have town government. We have independent school districts. We have county government. So we have. Uh, for a state our size, more units of local government than most, if not all. Um, the states that have more local government than Wisconsin all tend to be much bigger geographically and in terms of population. That is our heritage. And if anybody suggests merging a town or merging two counties, uh, you might as well just slip your wrists because it ain't gonna happen. Um, it might make sense intellectually, but it ain't going to happen politically. The other, so we have that, and then you have with it then this influx of Germans and Scandinavians, and you put all that in a pot and you, you stir it around and we got the progressives. And um, that resulted in a very unusual approach to funding government. So you have all this local government over here, towns, counties, school districts, etc., 3,000 units or so. Um, and then you have the progressive era and the socialists in Milwaukee and so forth, and they decided, well, let's try to relieve the property tax a little bit, so we'll create a state income tax. Um, well, it, did, it didn't work. It worked for a while, except that uh, our property taxes <coughs> still remain you know, 10, 15, 20 percent above the national average, uh, and our, our income tax continues to plot along. But what that did is it created this system in Wisconsin that's very different than most other states. And that is, you have the majority of all the tax money being collected at the state level, mainly through a very powerful, growing state income tax uh, and a reasonably uh, successful sales tax. But you still have a majority of the services being delivered at the county municipal school level. So it's this strange state does the money raising, locals do the service delivery, and what has historically held the whole system together is a state aid system, shared revenues for counties and municipalities, uh, school aids uh, for schools, and, and some other kinds of programs for other units. So, <clears throat> What that means is the state and local governments are very much joined at the hip uh, in fiscally, in terms of running government. And so when we talk about the state of Walworth County, we have to talk about the state of state government. Um, and that's what I'm going to, I'm sort of going to talk a little bit about the revenues, a little bit about the expenditures, a little bit about transportation, and then I'll wrap it up. Um, <clears throat> so you've got almost all of state revenues, 95% coming from either the two income taxes or sales taxes. So they all go like this with the economy. Um, the corporate income tax uh, tends to uh, predate recessions in its behavior. So when it starts to slow, it tends to be hinting at a recession. And it is interesting that the, the collections for the year just ending, 
we're up 3% and the forecast for next year is 1%. So, you know, are the tea leaves starting to align? Um, we don't see that so much with the, with the income tax and the sales tax. The, the income tax has been consistently growing about uh, 4% per year and the sales tax uh, somewhere in the three to four plus range. The sales tax collections also have been slowing a little bit. I, I would think if I were sitting in Dave's seat, I would be rather happy to have revenues growing 4% a year because his honor haven't been growing at all, basically. And that's true with, with county and municipal government all over the state. Um, so that's the difference between having an income tax and a sales tax that grow with the economy and you get to spend the money, and a property tax that is levy limited, limit, levy limited, so it doesn't really grow. Um, plus, their state aids don't grow either. Um, so um, that's sort of the nature of the of the state finances and the economy. It's it's chugging along. It's growing. Um, and you have to say nationally that we don't see a recession in the immediate future. Uh, we should also say, however, that this recovery is one of the longest we've had in, since post-war, so and we're due, folks. Um, <clears throat> so that's sort of the, the, the revenue side. The state has been plugging along. The, the spending side is, is very interesting because really, when you look at what the state is spending its money on, most of the no, new money is only going to two places. It's going to Medicaid, Healthcare for low-income individuals. I can remember back in 2009 when Medicaid was only nine or ten percent of the state budget. It's now 18 percent. I mean, Medicaid is is the program that's eating the state budget. Um, and if there's extra money around, the other thing the state will spend money on is school aids, uh, and that has been the headline story this year. Um, the, uh, the school aid budget in this current budget is going up like a half a billion dollars. It's a very hefty increase compared to the past. Um, so while Medicaid and school aids have tended to be the winners in state budgets, the losers have tended to be state aids to counties and municipalities, community aids to counties, and the university system. Uh, it's just some things are eating money and other things are, are giving it up. Um, and of course the beauty, <laughs> uh, in a sense for the state politically, is it can live off growing income and sales tax revenues while at the same time telling the locals that they don't get to uh, raise property taxes. Um, so there, there, it's just, You'll note I've retired so I can sort of say what I think. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm not, a, I'm not a, you know, I'm just reporting trends. I mean, some folks have it better than other folks. There are winners and losers. Um, which sort of brings me to transportation. Um, and to be very honest, among people that are independent experts that study this problem, there is no disagreement. I mean, it's very clear. Um, we have, the basic problem has been for a very long time that we have spending pressures that have been building for 40, 50, 60 years. And that is we built a lot of interstates, we built four lane highways in the 60s and, and so forth. Uh, many of us remember that as younger people. Um, and those uh, have come to their useful end of life. Um, I, I was really struck by that driving down I-39 this morning and seeing massive piles of concrete and asphalt along the side where they were literally ripping up the highway, dumping it on the side and getting it rebuilt. And that is a major challenge throughout, particularly southeast Wisconsin. They're very expensive project, very, um, and we don't have a lot of choice given that they've ended their useful life. The other part of the problem, of course, is the revenue side, and that is we have a tax system uh, to pay for roads 
that is very different than the income and sales tax system. The income and sales taxes basically grow automatically. So the governor and legislature have more money except when the economy is really tanking. Um, that's not true with transportation. The gas tax is a flat cents per gallon. And because of all sorts of trends, rising costs of building, um, people driving less because of millennials tending to be urban and the aging population tending to drive less, and particularly the federal mandates on energy efficiency of vehicles mean people aren't buying more gallons of gas. So the gas tax just isn't going up. And the same for vehicle registration fees. So you've got all this pressure on the spending side and you have no growth on the revenue side. And that, in a sense, is the problem. And we've known it for 20 years. Um, there have been all sorts of study commissions and task forces and so forth. Um, so the solution um, has been basically stopgap for a number of years. Governor Doyle uh, couldn't balance the general fund budget back in the, his term, so he raided the transportation fund, pulled the billion four out, uh, which depleted the fund. And so what did he do to pay for transportation? He started to borrow. Uh, Governor Walker faced stagnating revenues and increasing building costs, so what did he do? He borrowed more. And so now we're in a situation where about one in five of the gas tax dollars you pay in the state aren't going to build roads or repair roads at all. They're going to pay off old debt. Um, so that so not only is the gas tax not going, a good part of it's been siphoned off to uh, pay uh, for borrowing. The other way we're dealing with this stopgap is we're simply canceling or delaying projects. Um, and uh, People in, particularly in the city of Milwaukee, are, are pretty crabby. The business community in Milwaukee is pretty crabby because they've just decided to stop uh, on some of the projects in, uh, in Metro Milwaukee. Um, this is not inconsequential for not only Milwaukee, but the collar counties that feed into it, like Walworth, because 60% of the truck traffic that feeds manufacturing plants, commuter traffic and everything is flowing through that interstate freeway system and it's being delayed and some of it's being stopped. So um, those are the sort of challenges that the state faces and therefore it ripple down to local government. Um, just in the last minute or two, what do we see ahead? We've already begun, believe it or not, the 2019-2021 uh, state budget process. The governor issued instructions within the last month. Agencies will send out, will return their requests in September, and right after the gubernatorial election, the governor has to sit down and put a budget together by January, February. So we really are on the cusp of the next state budget. Um, it looks like the revenues are going to hold up reasonably well. I, you know, we aren't seeing a recession. Um, there are some pressures on the spending side, though. The biggest is we just added a half a billion dollars to base budgets in terms of school aid. That's you know, one way we're spending to get reelected, um, to be honest. Um, and that you have to maintain, and then there'll be pressure to increase it. Um, we had built up relatively good budget surpluses. Um, we were up, as of the end of the last fiscal year, up over $600 million. But um, through increased school happening since then is we've just been pulling that balance down through increase. So um, I guess stay tuned. Um, hopefully I've rained on most parades here. And uh, you'll never be invited again, but that's okay. I'm, I'm having fun. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm painting, I'm sculpting, I'm training my dog, I'm learning Italian, I'm gardening, and uh, I don't give speeches much anymore. So good to talk to you. Good morning. So I think Derek and 
the interest of time, what I'm going to do is to make sure that we leave enough for questions. Uh, I got two things to go through here. So the first one is to tell you a little bit more about the Foxconn project. So this is you know, this is the example of the little dog, the fierce little dog that's been chasing cars for years and actually caught one. <laughs> so we'll, we'll take you through a little bit about the metrics on this, what it means for southeastern Wisconsin, of which in Walworth County it's going to ha certainly have a significant impact, we think, over the next number of years. Um, let's see where we're at, Derek, in terms of time after that. Uh, and if we've got some time left, then we'll talk about how M7 really positions this region, not only to capture projects like that, but we've worked on a number of deals. What are the assets that we sell? But again, I'm not sure we're going to have time to get to that, so let's, let's just get started here with the Foxconn project. So a little bit about M7, if you're not familiar with us, uh, we are the Regional Economic Development Entity for Southeastern Wisconsin. So the seven refers to the seven counties that comprise the region, of which, of course, uh, Walworth is one of those. Uh, a lot of different things that M7 works on. Uh, my part of the organization, my little sliver of it, is pretty straightforward. Uh, I work directly with companies that are interested in doing two things in this region. They're either going to create jobs or invest capital. So most of the time, the stuff that I work on, it's going to be companies that already have some presence here. They're thinking about expanding. Maybe they do it here. Maybe they do it in other parts of the world uh, where they've got operations. I'm selfish in that way. We want those expansions to be here. And then, of course, there's examples like Foxconn, Haribo, and many others, corporate attraction projects. So these are uh, companies that have no presence in our region. And these are deals that we're going to compete with other locations around the United States uh, to secure those things. So uh, just a little bit in terms of broadly about our metrics, we got started about 12 years ago uh, on the corporate attraction and expansion side. In that time, 85 uh, project wins that we worked on, uh, and you see some of the numbers that have come from there. So almost 29,000 jobs as a result of those uh, 85 projects, about a billion and a half each and every year in terms of payroll that's been added to this region, and uh, 11.4 billion in terms of capital investment. Uh, these are some of the projects that we've secured in the last year or so. A number of these are companies that you're going you're to recognize uh, their logos. But I think, again, what we want to focus on here in the next couple of minutes is to talk a little bit more about Foxconn. So about the company, uh, we hooked a big fish here, folks. Uh, this is a company, of course, Asian in, in terms of, of their headquarters in, in Taiwan. Uh, and this is a really, really big company. In fact, one of the biggest companies on the face of the earth. Uh, 25th largest uh, on the planet in terms of total sales, so about $136 billion a year uh, is how much uh, product these guys are selling each and every year. Uh, and this is the sixth largest private sector employer on the earth. 1.3 million employees is how many they have uh, in their operations that are spread all over all of the, the, uh, the continents here on the planet. Uh, in terms of their pedigree, uh, what you know them best for, of course, is they're a manufacturer of consumer electronics. So about 50% 50 per, 50 uh, of, of the consumer electronics that are sold worldwide are made by Foxconn. So there's a lot of different things that they're known for. You see some of the brands up there. This is just a small sampling. It, it, would, be, it would shock me if you don't have probably five, six, seven devices in your home that are made by Foxconn, even though they don't certainly have the Foxconn brand on them. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, again, uh, a global footprint in terms of their uh, where they're operating. But this is not a company, if you, if, they, if you think about what their vision is for the future, this is not a company that's interested in continuing to be a manufacturer of products for somebody else. So what you're seeing is a company that is very much so starting to vertically integrate and, and turning much more so deeply into a technology company. 55,000 patents is how many uh, this company controls. Uh, and one of the uh, purchases that they made uh, recently that I think is really indicative of where they're going as a company, and frankly why we got as excited about this deal as we did, is they own controlling interest in Sharp. So again, that vertical integration is what these guys are looking to do, and the investment that they'll be making here in southeastern Wisconsin is really about that. So you think about what do they want to be in the future, that's what they want to be in the future. So they see themselves as becoming much more so a robust competitor to Samsung. So what are they going to do here in Wisconsin? Um, we've, we've all seen these numbers before, but I think they're worth repeating. 
13,000 jobs is how many jobs they'll have here in the state of Wisconsin. Almost all of those jobs will be uh, just to our east in Racine County. A $10 billion capital investment, 22 million square feet of operating footprint they'll have on that campus in Mount Pleasant. And this will be the only LCD production facility on the planet that's not located in Asia. So we talk a lot about bringing manufacturing back to the U.S. Uh, th this is what that looks like. It's, it's about these metrics that you see right here, all of these devices today, all of the next generation LCD panels that are used in all the different applications, all the verticals that we're aware of, all that stuff is made in Asia. Even though for generations, we, those technologies have been developed here. It's been our universities and our researchers that have developed those technologies. But all the devices have been made in Asia. We're bringing a lot of that back here, and Wisconsin is going to be at the center of that work. Uh, it's worth telling you this as well. Um, this is the largest corporate attraction project in United States history. So you think about all of the European and Asian investments in the automotive space. You think about Tesla, the gigafactory that they've got out in Nevada. This is larger than all those. Now, I'm not going to be able to use this slide much longer because uh, Amazon, as you know, is putting a second headquarter somewhere in the United States. That'll be about 50,000 jobs, but I'm going to make sure I, I keep using this as long as I can there. So this is uh, uh, an aerial that gives you a sense of the campus and how it will lay out in, um, uh, in Mount Pleasant. So you've got Milwaukee up here, Chicago down here, Walworth, of course, is over here three areas. It's about a 3,000 acre campus. Uh, area one, which you see right here, this is where Foxconn will actually do the manufacturing. So this is bordered by KR on the south, which is the border, of course, between, between Racine and Kenosha counties. You've got Interstate 94 that's right there. Area two is what we're calling an area for Foxconn expansion. What we think that's going to be is their supplier campus. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like in just a second. Area three is construction staging. As you can imagine, with the numbers uh, of people and the amount of equipment that's going to be there to create a 22 million square foot campus, we're going to have to have an area for staging. But that's this, an interesting plot of land because that opens itself up to other development opportunities once construction of the campus is done. So this is a rendering uh, of what that air. So again, go back to area one right here. This, this is a rendering that shows, excuse me, this shows um, what the campus will lay out, uh, how it will lay out uh, in Mount Pleasant. To put this in perspective, that's a 747 that you see right there. So it gives you a sense of the size and the scale of what we're talking about. Uh, if that's not enough for you, this campus is the size of the village of Shorewood, which is the, uh, one of the first northern suburbs in Milwaukee County. So what are they going to pr produce here? One of the things I want to do, I thought I'd show you a video. So we, we competed against a number of different states for this project. As we started to get down to the short strokes, uh, they invited our team, led by Governor Walker, to go visit the Foxconn people at their plant in Osaka, Japan. So this is a plant that makes some of those advanced LCD uh, panels. They wanted us to see how it worked, and they showed us a video that I just want to share with you. Experience, and that's coming really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the interior of a car is really no different than when Henry Ford was putting Model T's on the road. You get into the car, it's on the left-hand side where the driver is, or somebody next to you, there's some people behind you. But the driverless car enables us to reimagine the entire interior. And so the interior, what you would have seen in that video, is Mercedes driverless car. Um, screens are all throughout. So you can look to your left and you'll be able to see your desktop, desktop as it appears at the office when you get into the office. And if you want to just surf the internet, you want to check the weather for today, here's another screen over here. And if you and your family are going to take a drive uh, down to Chicago, the four of you can watch a movie on these screens. This is what got us excited about all this. It's because if you exercise to try to put a little of this into some sort of context, 
if you look at three of the biggest spenders here, that are located here in the state in terms of spending with other Wisconsin-based companies, so supply chain spend that they have with companies right inside our borders here. Those three companies, Oshkosh, Quad Graphics, and Marinette Marine uh, up in northeastern Wisconsin, you put together their total supply chain spend with Wisconsin companies, it's about $475 million. Foxconn has committed to us that they will spend $1.4 billion each and every year with Wisconsin-based companies. And the story on supply chain really just gets better. So the $1.4 billion, which you see right here, is actually a small component of their total supply chain spend. Again, this is the very first LCD production uh, operation that's not located in Asia. So there's a number of suppliers that, that they're going to need, but we just don't have them. Not only do we not have them in southeastern Wisconsin, we don't have them in Wisconsin, we don't even have them in the United States. And so there will be 150 companies that have to come with Foxconn. So these are companies that well, many of them will locate on that supplier campus, but we also think a number of them will populate sites uh, throughout southeastern Wisconsin, and frankly, it'll get driven uh, into the central and northern part of the state as well. Um, one of the important things about this project is how this project starts to draw us closer to Chicago. Um, when we talked about, Todd talked a little bit about the hammock, I like, I like that description. Um, we have a really unique advantage in southeastern Wisconsin in that we've got a large global city, 8 million people, that's right at our doorstep. Cleveland can't say that, Indianapolis can't say that, St. Louis can't say that. Now, 10 years ago, in my job, none of us would have stood up and saying, being, stood up and said being close to Chicago was a good thing. And we saw it as a competitive relationship, they win, we lose, that sort of thing. No more. I mean, we sold Foxconn on the idea that if you're located in southeastern Wisconsin, you decide to make that investment here, uh, you can draw workforce not only from this area, but you can also draw workforce up from northeastern Illinois. A really good advantage for us, I think, as a location. You think about development patterns that have happened uh, in this part of the state, uh, and really, again, dropping down to our south, to our neighbors in Chicago, and the number of patterns that you see, traditionally before Foxconn, Milwaukee has always kind of looked west and north. That's where the development patterns have gone. They've gone a little bit south, but not much further than the Milwaukee County, uh, Racine County border. Now, Chicago and Illinois, of course, they're their troubles are well known. Uh, you know, we joke about it all the time with our board. There's no better economic development partner uh, for southeastern Wisconsin than the state of Illinois. Um, they, they have done a lot of things to help us over the years, and so we have seen a lot of development activity that's pushed um, north into Racine County, uh, Kenosha County, and of course here in Walworth County as well. But most of that development actually doesn't make it to Racine. It, it gets caught by this county, and it really gets caught by, uh, by Kenosha County as well. What the Foxconn um, uh, development does is it really fills that donut hole that's been seen. And we haven't seen that push from Milwaukee, we haven't seen that push from Chicago, and I think what you're gonna start to see is that corridor now will fill in in a very meaningful way, and you'll start to see the two regions be connected uh, in ways that we simply haven't seen in the past. So I'll close on this, just some recent developments. Um, there's, there's nothing that, that, that politicians that approve $4 billion in incentives like to see more than this. Um, so to start see construction on this facility start, uh, these are some photos that I took about 10 days ago. You see, you see the earth movers over here. The site is starting to be graded. Uh, you've started to see, of course, uh, the infrastructure work. So if you've driven down 94 in Racine County, uh, a lot of that work in terms of the roadways, the sewer, the water, uh, is well underway. Um, 30 uh, contractors have been selected already for the site prep work. Uh, I believe all of those except for one are located here in the state of Wisconsin. If you look at the jobs impact, um, I believe the workforce will come from 60, when you look at those 30 companies, the workforce will come from 60 of the 72 counties in Wisconsin. So again, driving that impact for the state's investment uh, deep into every county in our state. Uh, last week, the bid packages were released for construction of the initial campus buildings. We're taking a Wisconsin first approach here. I mean, if you're a construction company, uh, you want to work on the Foxconn project, being from Wisconsin is going to give you an, an advantage. We want to, again, capture as much of this work as we can within the borders of our state. Uh, master developer was selected, Hammonds Company. 
Um, I think one of the things you're going to see with this project, and even those of us who have worked on it from day one don't always have a good full understanding of this, is all of the ancillary development that's going to happen around that site. So you start thinking about hotels, you start thinking about retail, housing, this is really going to drive a lot of other activity based on the, the 10 billion that Foxconn is going to invest. Uh, Foxconn places, these are tech hubs that are going to be affiliated with our state universities all across the state. Again, trying to capture not only the talent that's coming out of our universities, but also a lot of those technologies and getting some of those universities to focus on technologies that companies like Foxconn and the ecosystem that develops uh, the kinds of technologies that we'll, we'll need for that. Uh, I was down in Mount Pleasant uh, about two weeks ago. There is a line up and running at a building that they have leased up at the corner of Highway 20 and uh, Interstate 94 where they're making TVs already. So these are TVs, about 60 inch screens, they're building about 250 of them each and every day. So they, they've got the parts that are coming in from elsewhere, they're assembling them at that facility. So these guys are up and running and they've got about 125 employees that are there already. Uh, they've announced that they're going to be starting a venture fund um, and, and we think that that thing could grow significantly, very, very large. And so again, they are really interested in investing in companies that are developing technologies that will go into this space. Let me close on this. Um, no surprise here. Um, th this is going to be the Foxconn project. We'll certainly be front and center in terms of the gubernatorial campaign and the election that we have in November. Um, the governor took a political risk, and we think it was the right risk to take. We think that the payback on this is going to be significant. But $3 billion is a lot of money. So you certainly haven't heard the last of Foxconn uh, in terms of the politics of it, and you know, we'll, we'll see how this all turns out in November. The last thing uh, I'll mention is just changing dynamics. So we're used to in Wisconsin, we're tied to a lot of a sort of traditional industries. So these are industries that make big capital investments in things. There's a particular product that they are going to manufacture, and they make that product for a long, long period of time. So yeah, the work changes some, but for the most part, over time, the, the operation looks in the future pretty much like it looks today. I don't think that's going to be the case with Foxconn. Um, I think they are fully committed to 13,000 employees. They're fully committed to $10 billion of capital investment, but the markets in which they serve in these technologies are changing dramatically. So today, we're making LCD panels. Maybe 15 years from now, we're making something different. Uh, but we like the odds, given the technologies that these guys have, the, the, the intellectual property that they control, their ability to adapt and move. And it's really going to require us and our workforce to adapt and move as well. So uh, with that, turn off the fire hose here. I think we've got time for a question.